So we're going to start right away, and uh, we're going to welcome Vincent Nioré, who's the, the uh, baron of the uh, Paris Bar. I wish you an excellent evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear Anne. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, on the behalf of the Bar Association of Paris and on behalf of Julie Couturier, the president of the Bar Association, I would like to tell you that I'm delighted to be welcoming you here to this conference organized side-by-side side with the FIDH and the Memorial France Association, which I recall is part of the Memorial Network, which has won the Nobel Peace Prize last year in 2022. And your association is one we really want to support because you, ladies and gentlemen, are doing incredible work in documentation and protection of rights exceptionally by combining a census of crimes committed in the states of the former USSR and more broadly in the former East Bloc and you're carrying out their historical analysis. This work, I emphasize, is indispensable. This work has shown once again this year its relevance as we see that war, war is back in the eastern part of Europe because the war in Ukraine is an nth expression of the north-south polarization of conflicts and it has once again emphasized an invisible link which is very solid uh, the, that exists between history and a reality today. Crimes of today are directly linked to the impunity of the past. The current war of aggression Russia is waging in Ukraine is part of a series of armed conflicts during the 1990s. Many war crimes have been committed and documented in that period. The perpetrators have been able to enjoy impunity that has been made into a system in parallel within the Federation, the Russian Federation. Freedom's fundamental rights have systematically been attacked. And this repression has become exacerbated since February 2022. Consequently, the expression of opinions that are not loyal to the authorities and not loyal to the war being waged against Ukraine is severely criminalized. A list of political prisoners held by Memorial, available on Memorial's site, is getting longer by the day. And it's important to say, in Russia today, those who defend human rights, those who document crimes and repression, those who endeavor to establish responsibility and fight impunity are living under threats at a scale that is unparalleled. Some who have lost their lives, like Natalia Estemirova, who was brutally assassinated when she was documenting crimes in Chechnya. Others have been persecuted, arrested, beaten, and searched. Last uh, 21 March, searches were conducted in Moscow at the homes of members of Memorial and members of their families as well were searched. Most of the people incriminated were not allowed to be assisted by a lawyer during the search. In France, the assistance of a lawyer during a legal search is not always guaranteed, and this is something flouting our most fundamental rights. And it is the uh, presence of a lawyer, this is something that the Paris Bar Association is fighting with very hard with the authorities to guarantee this. And the lawyers of memorial members have never been able to play their role, their role of defenders. Some have even had to leave the country because their freedom and their lives were threatened. So this evening, I am profoundly touched when I think of them, all of those who are fighting in Russia, Paris, and elsewhere to defend the principle of the rule of law and fundamental freedoms. And as the CDH says, we want to ensure the preeminence of the rule of law. And we risk our lives in 
defending rule of law. And I now would like to talk about the threats being made by Russia to Armenia. I'm very attached to Armenia. The Armenian government is envisioning ratification of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, a unique instrument in fighting impunity to enable continued prosecution of uh, war crimes committed by armed forces in our Azerbaijan. If Armenia ratifies the Rome Statute, it will in theory be obliged to arrest Vladimir Putin if he comes for a visit on its soil and extradite him to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. So these, uh, in recent months, Yerevan, the capital, has already refused several propagandists from the Kremlin to uh, enter, including a, uh, an Armenian of, uh, or that is a Russian of Armenian origin, Margarita Simonyan, after the uh, severe critic that sh criticism she made of the Prime Minister of Armenia, Nikol Pashinyan. So I'm thinking of all those fighting for this ideal of uh, justice. I hail their work, courage, and tenacity. Good evening, Mr. Lev Panamarov, who is here with us, and he's been working for 30 years with Andrei Sakharov. He never rested on his laurels and has worked incredibly to be an embodiment of this struggle for human rights. So during the roundtables, and I will be uh, handing the floor over to these roundtables, you will have the opportunity to hear these tireless, courageous fighters. The first roundtable will be moderated by Anna Nesta, who is the legal director of the Clooney Foundation for Justice. She's the chair of the board of directors of Crisis Action, and she's a member of the New York State Bar. And she has documented in the field Oh, throughout the years, crimes committed in Chechen, Chechnya, Syria, Georgia, and Ukraine, as well as many other countries. This first sequence will bring together experts of crimes committed by Russia outside its country, outside its borders. On this occasion, we will present a report entitled A Chain of Wars, Crimes and Impunity, the Russian Wars in Chechnya, Syria, and Ukraine. The second roundtable will be about the situations of those who are continuing to endeavor, despite everything, to resist um, arbitrary organization and do who are documenting crimes within Russia. And this will make it possible to understand how this criminalization of um, activists and opponents is organized and on which laws the repressive policy of the current government is based. And this second sequence will be modif moderated by Sasha Kulayev, a lecturer at Sciences Po in Paris, and she is a member of Memorial France, and I would like to thank her for having uh, carried out this project. I thank her from the bottom of my heart. And I would like to tell you that there is interpretation in English and French throughout the conference, and we will have a time for questions and answers at the end. So I thank very warmly, of course, Memorial France, thank you very much, and the FIDH, of course for having enabled us to bring together these exceptional speakers and witnesses. I wish you all a very nice conference, and I thank you very much. Merci beaucoup et bonne soirée. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening. I will speak uh, English, I think. Uh, some of our panelists will speak English and some will speak French. and. Uh, I'll try to moderate in between. Um, my name is Anja Neistat. I'm a legal director for the Clooney Foundation for Justice, where I lead an initiative that is called the Docket, Le Dossier, uh, which deals with investigations and legal action in cases of international crimes. I will not make uh, a long introduction, but uh, first of all, uh, I will introduce uh, this panel, and then we'll get started because we are a little bit delayed. Um, 
The first to speak will be uh, Yulia Chistikova, who is um, from the East Ukrainian Center for Civic Initiatives and who has been documenting crimes committed by Russia and Ukraine since 2014 and to this day. She will be followed by Alexander Cherkasov um, from uh, the Memorial Human Rights Center and uh, Alexander will present uh, the most recent um, uh, report uh, which is called uh, uh, Chain of uh, Wars, Chain of Crimes, uh, Chain of Impunity. Uh, the same uh, title that we stole for this panel. Uh, then, uh, Mazan Darwish, uh, president of the uh, Syrian Center for Media and Freedom of Expression, uh, who will talk about uh, Russian crimes committed in Syria. And uh, the last but not least, uh, Risa Traoré, who is um, the honorary president uh, of Ivorian Movement for uh, Human Rights and uh, secretary general of uh, Fideash, who will talk uh, to us about uh, the reign of impunity in Mali. Uh, as I promised, my introduction will not be long. Uh, I will just say that I am very honored uh, to be moderating this panel. It is very close to my heart. Uh, this chain of impunity for crimes committed by Russia is something that I devoted my life and my professional career to, having started in Chechnya uh, and then working in uh, Georgia, which we could not add to this panel just due to time limitations, but uh, which should be mentioned in this chain of crimes and impunity, and then having worked uh, in Ukraine back in 2014 in Syria, and now working back in Ukraine from where I just came back uh, again just a few weeks ago. Uh, I do think that, uh, I hope that today we'll talk not only about all of these uh, separate conflicts and wars in which Russia played a critical role, but also about this moment, which for me continues to be a moment of hope that this chain of impunity will finally stop. Yulia, over to you. Good evening to everybody and uh, uh, well uh, one year of more than one year of war in Ukraine has passed uh, and uh, of uh, uh, aggression uh, full scale aggression has passed but uh, nine years of uh, war uh, actually so uh, the last three years of my professional activities were uh, directly connected with this war because I work as a part of team uh, of NGO that documents uh, human rights violation on occupied territories, occupied by Russians, of course, uh, territories and uh, gives uh, legal aid to, to people who went through the occupation and uh, whose rights been violated. Uh, today, I would like to specify directly on uh, one uh, specific type of violations. It is sexual and gender-based uh, violence, uh, which is directly uh, connected to the armed conflict. Uh, this uh, type of crimes uh, we've been uh, documenting since the beginning of uh, Russian aggression in 2014. And of course, uh, since the February 2022, we had this huge wave of new information, of new data about sexual violence that happened on occupied territories of Ukraine. Uh, but to start with, I would like uh, to uh, make some clearness with the definitions. Uh, among the international organizations, uh, the most used term is conflict-related sexual violence which covers uh, rape, sexual slavery, forced prostitution, forced preg uh, pregnancy, forced abortion, sterilization, marriage, uh, and uh, can be uh, applicable for women, men, boys, and women, uh, and girls, sorry. Uh, why I prefer to use more general term, uh, sexual and gender-based violence, because it covers more violations. Not all violations that we've been documenting uh, directly uh, involve this part of sexual violence, but uh, they uh, have this gender basis. For example, uh, Unfortunately, I can't demonstrate the photo of uh, released Ukrainian uh, soldiers uh, 
uh, women officers who've been released from Russian captivity and whose heads been shaved. It's not a sexual violence, but it's definitely a gender violence because uh, uh, among a lot of cultures, uh, the hair of woman is really connected to her honor, to her dignity, and in Ukrainian and Russian uh, culture as well. So this gesture, which was made by detainers on Russia Federation, is clearly violent and is clearly gender-based. Uh, so that's why I think we uh, should prefer to this more uh, general term, sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, so. Uh, if we are talking about prosecution and uh, documentation of this type of violence, I might say that it is uh, one of the hardest. First of all, it is a very uh, sensitive question. Uh, in every culture, the sex uh, matters are very sensitive and hard to talk and hard to discuss uh, about. Uh, as well as in Ukrainian uh, culture, I can say that the theme of sex is quite tabooed and quite close. So this is the reason why uh, survivors uh, are not very open and it's really hard to uh, get a real information, real data about this type of violence. Uh, as well as for Ukrainian society, unfortunately, it is typical uh, to have this victim blaming practice, especially in small communities. And we see it right now uh, documenting sexual violence on uh, deoccupied territories of uh, the north of Ukraine. Kiev, Chernihiv, uh, Sumer region, because uh, mainly the small villages were occupied. And survivors are not ready to talk openly about their tragic experience because they are afraid how the community will react. So the sexual violence it's not uh, and gender-based violence, it's not only the violence that happens to one person. It always covers a more broad uh, a range of people because it's, uh, it covers family, it covers the community and it's very important to, to work properly with these types of uh, crimes and uh, with survivors of these type of crimes. Uh, if we go to legislative level, uh, we go to the uh, Roman St uh, Statute of Rome uh, of the International uh, Criminal Court and Ukraine, uh, neither Ukraine nor Russia have uh, ratified these statutes, but Ukraine has uh, made uh, a statement that it recognizes its ju uh, jurisdiction under three blocks of cases. One are events uh, that happened uh, on Maidan during the Revolution of Dignity, another block uh, cases, uh, events that happened uh, on the east of Ukraine, uh, since 2014, and the third one, uh, the cases uh, that happened after the February 2022. And we see how rapidly this investigation right now is happening by ICC, by the prosecutor, because we now know about this uh, warrant on arrest for the Putin, uh, for this so-called ombudsman. So we see that uh, the court works on these cases right now. So, uh, can ICC prosecute sexual violence under the Roman Statute? Yes. We have these uh, three articles. Article 8, uh, war crimes, that includes uh, sexual violence as well. We have Article 7, crimes against humanity. Again, that uh, uh, sexual violence can be qualified as uh, such type of crimes. And we have a genocide. Article 6 uh, on genocide, uh, which includes uh, imposing measures intending to prevent births within the group uh, with intent to destroy in all or in part its national, ethnic, racial or religious group as such. And after the occupation of northern part uh, of Ukraine uh, last uh, uh, spring, April, May, uh, when we had this uh, huge amount of information about uh, sexual violence, uh, a lot of uh, uh, academics, a lot of practitioners uh, started to discuss, can we qualify uh, those violence as uh, uh, part of genocide policy? Can we qualify those violence as genocide rapes or not? 
so uh, if we go to national law, unfortunately, uh, still Ukrainian criminal code has not modified its provision. And uh, if we go to the article 438 of the national criminal code, we see that there is no specific mention uh, of uh, sexual violence as uh, the violence of the laws and customs of war. Uh, unfortunately, the amendments uh, are not made yet on the ninth year of uh, the war. As well as another article uh, of the criminal court that uh, puts a responsibility for violence against the population in the era of uh, hostilities. It does not specify what kind of violence uh, can be prosecuted. So on national level, uh, we have the situation that national legislation does not give enough tools uh, for law enforcement body to work with. And uh, that caused that uh, since 2014 until uh, 2022, unfortunately, national law enforcement bodies did not work properly on this sphere. Uh, we didn't have uh, cases that were opened uh, against the sexual violence that uh, occurred on the territory uh, covered by armed conflict in Ukraine. Uh, so, but according to the uh, report uh, my organization has made, uh, every third woman and every first man among the respondents who've been kept on the places of uh, detention on occupied by Russian, uh, by Russian army uh, territories of Donetsk and Lugansk regions, have been, uh, uh, have suffered or have been witness to sexual violence. And we should consider that this is not a real data because a lot of people keep, uh, keep uh, silence about this type of violence. Uh, so, uh, a little bit uh, the situation has changed uh, since uh, the full-scale invasion because uh, the uh, public authorities, uh, the uh, society in general, have started to uh, discuss uh, the questions of sexual violence uh, on occupied territories uh, quite openly. We right now have uh, uh, the declaration of uh, Ukrainian president, the declarations of the Ukrainian uh, prosecutor general, that this type of uh, violence should be prosecuted very precisely and uh, very openly. And even a special department uh, was created as a part of uh, general prosecutor's office in Ukraine. Uh, so a big uh, amount of attention right now is drawn to the question of sexual violence. Uh, which is good. Uh, right now we have uh, special uh, mobile teams that work on the grounds on deoccupied territories, uh, first on the north of Ukraine, right now on the southern parts, on the eastern part in Kharkiv region. And thanks to uh, these mobile uh, groups, we gather uh, the uh, legal data. Uh, and those groups, which is good, include not only prosecutors, not only policemen, but they include uh, psychologists and they include uh, the people from NGO sector, the people from global rights compliance um, uh, organization. Uh, so, uh, despite we have this uh, quite broad uh, uh, acknowledgement about sexual violence and that it is used uh, as a part of politics by Russian uh, army on occupied territories, we don't have a quite big amount of cases uh, opened on these uh, articles. So for now, the latest data is that uh, the prosecutor's office is investigating 171 cases of sexual violence against Ukrainians by the Russian military. Uh, among the victims are 39 men, uh, 13 minors, among uh, them one boy. Uh, so, uh, if we compare the amount of this uh, media information and the amount of this legal information, legal data we have now, of course the numbers are very low and this is the problem. Why people uh, do not talk, why they do not plead for uh, help for prosecution of this violence. Uh, among the biggest problem is uh, the low le uh, level of uh, trust for law enforcement bodies in Ukraine. 
unfortunately, we have this experience of previous eight years when law enforcement bodies did not show their um, ambitions did not show their desire to investigate such types of uh, cases, uh, while uh, sexual violence and gender-based violence. Uh, among another problem is that uh, professional capacity of law enforcement bodies in this particular sphere, in the spheres of war crimes, in the sphere of uh, sexual and gender-based violence, is again not enough. Uh, that's why right now a series of special trainings are held for uh, law enforcement bodies in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, uh, it's not enough. They don't have this uh, legal. In, they don't have enough of these legal tools. How to investigate? How to documentate? How to work with proofs in a proper way? Uh, how uh, the courts will uh, uh, interpret uh, these articles of the National Criminal Code? Uh, not to uh, break. Uh, the whole case, the whole uh, investigation in the courts. It's uh, very difficult from the uh, legal technical point of view. Another problem uh, on which uh, survivors uh, emphasize it is the lack of empathy. When you go to police, when you go to prosecutor's office, uh, the, the whole procedure is so uh, automatic, it's no empathy. People do it in an automatic way, just uh, putting information, just typing what you say, and no understanding what uh, survivor went through. And again, it's a specific type of violence. It hurts not only physical, it uh, hurts uh, psychological health too. And it uh, gives uh, a huge impact on the whole life of the survivor. Uh, unfortunately, again, uh, for the nine years of uh, war conflict on Ukraine, Ukrainian government has not built a sufficient system of uh, psychological support for survivors, of medical support for survivors. Uh, that's why a lot, of, a lot of people think that it's easier just to, to settle down and to try to continue living without all this bureaucracy, without all this paper um, work you have to do anyway if you go to police and try to start the persecution. Uh, the, another uh, problem uh, and the solution for this uh, problem uh, by, uh, on the opinion, on the point of view of the survivors is that for now Ukraine has no efficient system of reparation uh, for uh, the survivors. Uh, Ukraine does not recognize uh, the survivors of sexual and gender-based violence on official way. There is no such special legal status. So a lot of uh, women who went through this type of uh, violence uh, consider that if it's going to be efficient system of reparation, it's going to help to uh, increase the number of uh, official prosecutings. Because uh, women or men will, uh, will see that a system works, and if you go to police, then you can have some efficient help. So it uh, might work uh, in a good way. So, uh, to sum up, uh, unfortunately, uh, each war conflict brings sexual violence with it. And uh, Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine uh, shows that uh, it is uh, a rule and no exceptions uh, here. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, to work on this type of uh, crimes, to prosecute, to document it, it should be a coalition of government, it should be a coalition with uh, international partners uh, and non-governmental organizations as well. And the main aim of this coalition is to make uh, the survivors feel protected, to uh, make them feel that uh, they're going to have some help and some sufficient help in all range of specters, medical, psychological, maybe some help of work, financial, etc. And only then uh, we can uh, talk about uh, increasing numbers of real persecution in the cases of sexual and gender-based violence. Thank you. I hope I did not took, overtook my time. Thank you. You did a little bit, but it's okay. Uh, I did not want to interrupt. Um, um, thank you very much. We would need to uh, start catching up on time a little bit. 
so uh, Sasha, I'm counting on you to be as concise as you possibly can. Um. Bonjour. I will try to speak French, but I will speak slowly so, for the interpretation. Here, we're talking about a report that has been prepared by, uh, you know, those from Memorial on the experience of the research uh, that Memorial has conducted during the armed conflicts in Russia and armed conflicts outside of Russia uh, where the Russian army was participating. What is the whole point of this report? The idea is very simple. That is, in the long chain of wars, this ch these chains of impunity and crimes, like, it's like the reproduction of uh, war crimes and crimes against uh, humanity. The report is not perfect because this work has to be done. It does not contain the stories of people who who are, let's say, preaching this school of impunity. For instance, why? That what, for example, is a general doing in a brigade where Chechens were disappearing during the war? We saw, we found Chechens' bodies with traces of torture. What is the general who, in the year 2014, when he was participating in negotiations with the uh, head of the French Navy for the capitulation of the Ukrainian Navy? What was his work? in the um, military academy. The, the officers were trained on international law and uh, humanitarian law. It was, it was a school of impunity, in fact. In this report, we can understand The bombing of power plants in Ukraine, systematic bombing, was not the first such operation by the Russian forces. Because in Syria, they were bombing just as systematically, bombing hospitals, In Idlib, they were using the coordinates provided by the United Nations to protect these hospitals. That's why this practice it had been in the past used in Syria and then in Ukraine. All the heads of the military groups in Ukraine were the heads of military groups in Syria. It's very simple. It's easy to just look at the personal stories of these generals. But you understand? These stories are very different from American war stories. I know we hear a lot about what the Americans were doing during the conflict, for example, in Afghanistan or in Iraq, Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib, Bagrab, or Hankala, the military base in, of the Russian forces in Chechnya, 
During the American operations, there was systematic torture used. Prisoners were systematically tortured. But I do not know whether, let's say, close to Abu Ghraib or Guantanamo, would you have seen hundreds of corpses of people who had been tortured and then killed in Chechnya. The scale of forced disappearances was very serious. During the Second Chechen War, two to three to five thousand uh, people, inhabitants of Chechnya, just uh, disappeared. They were kidnapped, imp uh, imprisoned, tortured, executed, and their bodies were hidden from uh, three to five thousand. But there are only uh, four resolutions in, in courts. We, we hear only 9%. So this is a school for the military structures and the forced disappearances in Chechnya were sources where you might find, let's say, the corpses of uh, Ukrainians outside of Kharkiv or Kherson. These are stories of impunity. Perhaps you know the, the resolution of the court on the Boeing that was shot down on 17 June 2014. Two, there's Igor Strelkov. There are two names. He was convicted by a court in Chechnya. He worked on forced uh, disappearances in the FSB. He was working in that area, forced disappearances. He prepared them. I know 10 people where there are witnesses that Igor Strelkov prepared and carried out these forced disappearances. He was not punished and he was the uh, Minister of Defense of the Republic of Donetsk when the uh, plane with 300 civilians was shot down. But a person responsible for the movement of these uh, anti-air uh, missiles, when he was an instructor within the FSB, our special service, Dubinsk was an officer at the um, GRU, the military special service, and he was responsible for these uh, disappearances in the Chechen mountains. And this, he was not punished and was able to commit these crimes in the Donbass. That is why this school of impunity must be shut down. And if today we are talking a lot about a, a court for Putin for crimes being committed in Ukraine, we have to bear in mind the crimes that were committed in Syria because people from the Wagner group were using these hammers in Syria before Ukraine. They were doing it also in Chechnya and during other armed conflicts in the post-Soviet period. Today, perhaps, we could say that what was happening uh, during Yeltsin's time was not serious, but I want to say that this is a matter of perspective. When I was working on this report, I understood the scale of impunity and the scale of the magnitude of violence during the first Chechen war where I was working. I worked a long time on this. It was possible to do something to save someone, but overall it was as serious as what's happening today in Ukraine. In Grozny, in uh, uh, 
1994-95, the people were killed by the Russian bombs. There were 25 to 30,000 inhabitants of Grozny who were killed. That's more than or about the same number as was killed in Mariupol. So we must not forget the dead of Grozny. The same level of impunity because it was impossible to open up an investigation of these crimes during the first war in Chechnya as today with regard to the crimes in Syria and Ukraine. And we see the prisoners of war, for instance, in Mariupol. Today, we know that there are several prisoners of, of war. Our comrades, like uh, Maxim Butlevich, but the first Chechen war, not a single Chechen fighter was uh, arrested by the Russian forces, uh, was found in prisons. Perhaps they, they were taken or killed very quickly by uh, the Russians. That's why investigation of the events of that period of this young democratic Russia is very important. Perhaps I will do something in that direction, but we must not forget these topics. If we are going to talk about a tribunal for crime, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and we are moving to yet another conflict in which Russia played and continues to play uh, a very destructive role. Uh, Mazen, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. And let me start say that Alexander French is better my English. So I'll speak also slowly. There is no translation to Arabic. Thank you. <laughs> so, before I'm starting talking about the Russia crime in Syria, just I want to mention that I visit Ukraine in, in last year, and I go to Somi, Bucha, Bordonica, many other places. And the most important thing for me that when I met several victims in this area, they say that we knew what they did in Aleppo in 2016. One lady told me, because we see what happened in Aleppo, we feel fair from the beginning. And I believe that because there is no reaction, no legal or even strong reaction from the international community about what happened in Syria in 2016, we face this situation in Ukraine. So it's, it's very linked in the end in several places. Um, also, as um, any human rights organization, documentation for us, it's essential. This is the pace we start working from the beginning of the 2011, but also especially after 2015, when the Russia uh, uh, military came to Syria directly, and also with the Wagner BNC. And we know that there is no possibility to have any legal action or to have a court in Syria in this regards. So with our partner, Memorial and FIDH, we go to Moscow. Maybe it seemed like something crazy, but this is what we did in 2021. Uh, there is a Syrian victim in 2017, just 
tried to go to his family and unlikely catch from a, a Wagner group in, in, in the desert of Hamas Tadmor. And there is a video, I don't want to go in details, but they torture him, burn him, cut him. And there is a video, and this video show several faces and several person from Wagner Group. And thanks to Navetta Gazetta, who they start write about this and publishing the video and even try to have a legal action. Um, from our search, we get in contact with the family of the victim and they agree in the end to authorize us with Memorial and FIDH to have a complaint in Moscow. But this is also something my colleague mentioned, it's not easy for the victim to, to, to go in legal process for several reasons. Sometimes when we are talking about Wagner, Russia, they feel fair and they, this is I think normal, but also because the majority of them stop, believe in injustice and accountability. And this is the most dangerous. Regarding all this impunity happen, people lose their faith in justice and accountability. Um, lawyers, Ilya Novikov and Peter Zankin, and I'm sorry if, if the names, I don't spell it in a good way, uh, uh, they carry in, in their shoulders the uh, 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 legal action in Moscow. But as we expect, after almost two years, the Basmani court tried to, to start from the administrative staff. There is something missing, there is a point missing, uh, how we can be sure that this is addressed of the family, all these details, even if there is two lawyers present the victim and they have their offices and address in, in Moscow. But in the end, there is a decision from Basmani court and then we appeal in, in, in Moscow court. But in the end, the reason for refuse the complaint it show how the legal jurisdiction who should protect the victim just protect the suspect and just to try to cover this crime. So the reason coming said that there is no th certain that this guy die. Did even they play football in his uh, head after they cut it. And for the court, this is not evidence that he's died. And many other reasons. So, and this is something we, we believe from the beginning will happen, maybe not in this surreal uh, way, but it's very important for us and with our partner, Memorial and FIDH, to go to Moscow, to raise this case in, in, in Moscow. <coughs> to get attention from the ordinary people in Russia. And in, in, in 9 June 2022, we go to the European Court for Human Rights in this case. This is maybe our most important and for the first time, I believe that there is a try to sue Wagner in a court. But this is just a small windows and a small example 
that yeah, there is hope. We can do something. And there is a small steps we can build on it for the long term. This is not only this, but also we now trying also after meeting the uh, Minister of Justice uh, in Ukraine and uh, the General Prosecutor to find some solution, some of those who's linked to war crime in, 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 in Ukraine, the same people, the same officers linked to war crime in Syria. And there is some evidence, even photos show one of the pilot who's catch from the Ukrainian military that he were in Syria and even have photo with the president. Just yesterday we went to Geneva and we upload our UPR file against Russia. And maybe this is something seem like useless or crazy to go to Human Rights Council and the UPR process. But this is also one of the tools to keep the file on the table, even with the ICC decision. Also, with the special reporter about the mentionary, we repair a, a, a study called the Shadow Army about Wagner and what they did in Syria until now. And we try also to build the narrative because I think this is for us in Syria the most maybe important things that the Russian not only killed or destroyed, but also they try to change the narrative. They try to present themselves as a, a, a hero fighting ISIS and the extremism. And this is also very dangerous. Just I want to finish for what happened in Al Ghuta, by example, and using the chemical weapons against the civilian, 2013 or 18, and several times in, in Syria. And we see how the Russian government do huge work inside Syria, outside, make pressure against the doctors, the witness, the victim, uh, bring them from, from Syria to The Hague, to try to change the narrative. So this is also one of the fight, maybe not only in the court, for this, the reports, the UPR, the complaint, the cooperation between the Ukrainian uh, uh, civil society and the Syrian civil society, minimum, we can preserve the narrative. And this is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mazen, and I hope we can maybe come back to the question of uh, building the narrative and the question of propaganda, because if we're talking about how Russia has been learning uh, from war to war on how to do things, quote unquote, better from their perspective, I think that's on propaganda, that's what we can see now at its full scale, but it all started um, back in Chechnya and then was uh, improved, again, quote unquote, uh, in uh, Georgia and Syria, and uh, now we see what we see. Tisa. Uh, over to you. Uh, I am guessing that people here probably know more about uh, Mali than elsewhere. Uh, this conflict does not often uh, come up in the same uh, discussion about the chain of Russian crimes. So I think there will be a lot of interest uh, in, uh, in this connection. Merci. Thank you. I thank you. First and foremost, I must tell you where Mali is located, because I'm not sure that everybody knows exactly where Mali is. Mali is a country in West Africa, which was colonized by France and 
which became independent in 1960. Mali is partly desert. It's a good part of it which is made up of desert. Subsequent to the fall of uh, Muhammad al Qaddafi's fall in Libya, the north of Mali was invaded by terrorist, jihadist, who occupied a big part of Mali in 2012. They even proclaimed what they called the caliphate. Subsequently, France intervened with a military operation, making it possible to free the major cities of Mali. But unfortunately, the jihadists remained in the desert. They found refuge in different areas where they engage in taking hostages or they attack the Malian security forces, which led to a coup d'etat in Mali. Then there was a president who was elected, and then there were two overthrows that took place within the uh, space of eight months. The northern part of Mali is, we could say, occupied by the jihadist groups, and the center today is suffering from a conflict between the armed forces, the jihadists, but also the local population. And the FIDH and his Malian League, which is the Malian League for Human Rights, have since 2011 been endeavoring to work on fighting impunity to ensure that the jihadists who have occupied the northern part of Mali and who have set up the Sharia, the Islamic law, or their interpretation of it, so that they will be prosecuted. We have accompanied victims before the Malian justice and that since 2013 to engage le legal proceedings for crimes which could qualify as war crimes and crimes against humanity and especially sexual crimes. So we have had the support of the European Union, fun funding from the European Union and funding of France and the MT. And when the last coup d'etat took place just over a year ago in Mali, things have changed fundamentally. Why? Well, because this coup d'etat was condemned by the Economic uh, Western Africa uh, Association and the junta in France have, t well, not France, but the uh, junta turned to Russia. So they began to have a dialogue with Russia. And I recall that in the past, there was the Central African Republic, where there was a dialogue there, and the Wagner Group was intervening in the Central African Republic. And just as in Mali, the, the situation is pro protracted, the conflict is uh, protracted. Those who took power in Mali had trained in Russia, and then they went on vacation to Mali, and they committed this coup d'etat. So they already had some contacts with Russia. So. Wagner intervened, the French military withdrew, European military also withdrew, but as soon as the Wagner group got involved, there were executions, summary executions in Mora. It is a city in Mali, but in fact, this is something that was staged in order to discredit the French army. This was staged to make it look like uh, when the French army withdrew, it executed people. But the French had positioned drones in order to film what would happen around the French military camp that had been 
freed. Obviously, these drones were able to film operations and they, these drones showed that it, they were Malian military accompanied by white people who did not speak French. Whereas Mali had just said that the Russian instructors had been sent to Mali to train these Malian soldiers. Officially, Russia, through its foreign minister, said that Russia was not involved in Mali. The Malian authorities continued to uh, say that it is the Russian instructors and it is Mali intervening. So increasingly, the crimes being committed in the center of Mali and when the victims are questioned and we published, that is, FIDH has published a report last November on the center of Mali and the victims are clear in what they say. They are specific in what they say. They say these are Malian soldiers accompanied with people of a white race who do not speak French and they do not speak any national Malian languages. So obviously all the testimonies point to the Wagner group. And the big problem today is that Mali, with the presence of the Wagner group and the departure of the French military, we see that it's been closed. So it's very hard to conduct any proceedings because all people and associations that try to engage in legal proceedings are marginalized. As we have funding from the AFD, the Malian authorities have taken a decision according to which any organization which has French funding must no longer act on its territory. So that means, obviously, an unofficial list has circulated and FIDH is on that list. So these crimes are being committed in a hidden way, but we are trying to work on the information that can be gathered so when the time comes, proceedings can be initiated. And before concluding, I would like to recall that in the Central African Republic, Wagner had also intervened and is intervening in the Central African Republic where there are many crimes and violations committed by this armed group. Burkina Faso, which for the time does not have any official presence of the Wagner group, but when there are demonstrations in Burkina Faso, we see the wielding of Russian flags. So I can indicate that despite all that's happening in Ukraine and in other conflicts where Russia has intervened, for example, in Syria, there's a part of the African population that thinks that Russia will be the solution to problems and conflicts in Africa. Because when you see demonstrations, there are Russian flags wielded. And so this shows that the Wagner Group is at work and it's using the social networks to make people believe that it will be the solution. So as a human rights defender, seeing what is happening in other countries, we are very worried, especially because the arrival of the Wagner Group in uh, Mali in 2022, where there were many uh, human rights violations and many deaths, whereas there were many foreign forces in our country, but we never achieved these numbers. We never reached these numbers. So, of course, the Russian intervention in our country is not a good thing for Africa. And it is going to lead to a lot of human rights violations. Thank you very much. Um, Yulia Alexander, Mazen, uh, Drisa, thank you for... I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, I uh, don't think we have very much time left for questions, so I will skip my turn uh, and uh, 
Yeah, uh, but let's see uh, if there are questions from the audience right away. Uh, I'm glad uh, uh, many of you came this evening, and I want to make sure that you have a chance to start participating in the discussion. Uh, we have microphones for the floor. Uh, merci. Thank you. I have a question concerning Wagner and what happened in Syria, in Ukraine, in Mali, and to uh, concerning the, the possibility of uh, taking up the justice and in spite of uh, impunity. Do they uh, are they citizens of a given uh, country? Because for the International Criminal Court, it's always linked to the uh, citizenship of the uh, criminals. How can we deal with this? part for Wagner or similar organizations. I, 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 was one, I, I would like to ask Julia, because she talked about the, uh, the statute of victims of uh, sexual uh, crimes in Ukraine. She mentioned that it's difficult, there, there is a problem with definition, because the Rome, with the Rome statute. Is, is this a problem? Or uh, should these crimes be uh, uh, defined in the same way in the in Ukrainian law? And concerning the statute in Ukraine, you said as well they do not have a specific statute. Is this still according to the uh, Ukrainian uh, law or the uh, services that are uh, the dealing with them? And one last uh, question to my friend Mazim. I'm of the uh, Paris coordination of the Syrian coordination, and uh, Maz and my friend uh, took part in many discussions with us on Zoom. Wh how is it that you thought that it would be useful to uh, launch a legal action against Wagner in Russia? Because we know uh, from the start that the whole system is uh, uh, twisted. Is there somebody who advised you? I did not really understood the, the reason why you did this. It was three questions. Uh, I don't know if uh, Trisa or uh, Alexander, you want to take the first one about Wagner and uh, what would be the uh, legal basis for their prosecution. I can jump in, but I won't. I will direct it to you. Okay, uh, merci. Concernant Wagner au Mali... Uh... Thank you. Concerning Wagner in Mali, uh, for the moment, most of the testimonies show that these are Russian citizens, uh, simply because uh, from the different information uh, brought together. Mali has, has ratified the Rome Statute, and the situation in Mali and in the CPI, in the International Appeal uh, Court, there are two cases in Mali which are in front of the uh, ICP. That's why uh, we are uh, we were present here in Paris for the International Bureau of uh, FIDH, uh, and we took the opportunity to meet a number of uh, people in authority so that we could together work in order to make sure that the International Criminal Court could uh, open investigations in the center of the Mali, because the cases in front of the court are now con uh, only concerning cases in the north part of Mali. But the crimes for which persons who might be uh, Wagner mercenaries uh, are taking place in the center part of Mali, and we are now fighting so that the International Criminal Court uh, could launch inquiries in the center of Mali. And we hope that this will make it possible to shed some light and to uh, incriminate these people. Thank you. Which doesn't concern Mali about uh, Wagner specifically or you know, Russian army generally. Now for crimes committed in Ukraine, in principle, they can be prosecuted by the International Criminal Court. Because, uh, as I think Yule explained, uh, despite the fact that uh, neither Russia nor Ukraine have ratified the Rome Statute, the International Criminal Court 
opened an investigation based on Ukraine's request submitted earlier. And that means that everybody who commits crimes on the territory of Ukraine, including Wagner, which is now largely incorporated into the Russian army, can be prosecuted. They can also be prosecuted under the principle of universal jurisdiction in countries which do not require that the perpetrator is the national of the country. So, for example, in Slovakia, which has absolute so-called universal jurisdiction, a member of Wagner who, uh, against whom there is evidence that uh, they committed war crimes can be brought to justice. So uh, there are, we do have reports of foreign fighters amongst Wagner, but very few. But we basically don't need that to bring them to justice, at least in theory. Yes, and uh, on uh, sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, so uh, the uh, Roman statute has uh, uh, does qualify some sort of uh, sexual violence uh, that covers uh, the war crimes, the uh, crimes against humanity, and genocide as well. Uh, but it's a list of uh, specific actions and. Uh, are the actions of the same gravity that are covered by Geneva Convention. So uh, we can, uh, it's a matter of uh, interpretation, how court will interpret uh, this uh, phrase. And uh, are the actions of the same gravity, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so uh, concer uh, the concerning uh, Ukrainian legislation, again, unfortunately right now we don't have uh, uh, in case of uh, uh, war crimes in Ukrainian criminal court, we don't have uh, sexual violence or sexual and gender violence, a specific type of violence. Uh, we have a definition what is war crimes uh, under the criminal code of Ukraine, and it uh, covers some list of actions and other uh, violation of uh, general rules of war. So again, it's a matter of interpretation, how you interpret this phrase, what covers by this phrase, and this is uh, what makes it difficult for Ukrainian law enforcement bodies, because it's always difficult when you have uh, a lot of space in criminal procedures, because you don't know how, uh, you have to uh, have an instrument and to know precisely how to use it, because in other uh, cases, uh, the prosecution will not not be uh, succeeded because uh, we have advocacy, we have court, which uh, will uh, interpret uh, legal provisions. And uh, for me, why I think it's very important not to forget about this be uh, gender-based violence, because yes, not all actions can be uh, sexual, a part of sexual violence, but we should always consider this gender-based violence because uh, it's a specific type. It's specific type which aims to humiliate a person on uh, the base of its gender identity and I think we should not forget and we should uh, take it into consideration really, uh, really uh, attentively. Uh, Mazen, over to you. Uh, I know there was lots of discussions about this case. I don't know if you can summarize it in two sentences. I know that Alexander also wanted to say a few words, so between the two of you, but I encourage you to be concise so that we can take some more questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, my friend. Um, I don't know why you think it's weird. <laughs> Actually, this is, I think, the most important case we have it between 17 cases and several European country. Did you hope to have any result? I'm coming to, yeah. In the end, we want to go to the European Court for Human Rights. We can't go to the European Court for Human Rights before we follow all the uh, instruction or the legal uh, 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 prosecution or the, the legal court in Russia. So we need to prove that we go to the all type of jurisdiction and we appeal even blah blah blah, then we can go. So it's again the legal condition, it's not what we hope, it's not um, um, just ask and, and you will get. So this is very technical maybe, but also we are talking about 
Wagner and the Russian government. It's not about the Russian citizen or the Russian population, who they are also affected from the propaganda. So what done also from a, a, a memorial there, to have every time there is a decision from a court, to have a news in, in, in local uh, 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 media, independent websites, uh, some newspaper, write about this thing. This is very important. The press release and many lectures done from Alexander and his colleague inside Russia about this crime, about the rule of Wagner. This is very important. This, you maybe believe me, it's more important from the verdict itself. The process itself, it's very important also. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, moi, je veux uh, deux mots. Uh, pourquoi? I would like to add maybe two words. Uh, why did we have to go to the Russian court if we, know, we already know what the result uh, will be? It's very important. We have... Uh, we have discovered impunity and we have discovered the mechanisms of this impunity. For example, we are going to send an information on a given crime. What should the uh, investigation uh, prosecution do? They should uh, check uh, the elements of the inquiry uh, according to what Google tells me <laughs> is the correct translation, uh, they should make a decision, uh, open the inquiry, open the investigation, say uh, or say we should not open an investigation or we should send this to another institution or jurisdiction. But what do they do? No. They do not take our letter. It, they do not register the complaint in the uh, in, in in the register, uh, we they tell us we already we can already see that there's no reason to open uh, a case uh, from now. They see these videos with tortures, uh, people hit by uh, uh, hammers, uh, decapitation, etc., and they say that there is no reason to open a case. We have opened some letters from the military investigation committee and the decision of uh, three levels of uh, courts and they repeated almost exactly the same thing today we know that this was the level of impunity and we know what are the mechanisms uh, of this impunity our authority will not be able to say that there is no such thing. The same mechanisms uh, were used on other questions. For example, on uh, uh, threats of Ranzam Kadarov, you all know him, you know who he is. Uh, he, he was threatening journalists and human rights defenders using the same mechanisms, exactly. If we don't go to the Russian courts, we will not have, we will not be able to prove when we go to the to the next stage, etc., etc. But we have received the evidence against the uh, uh, professors, Soviet dissidents, uh, like uh, the academician uh, Sakharov. Very often we have to, we have to prove frequently. Often we have to get as much uh, information for testimony as possible. And this process against Wagner is very important. Again, Wagner in Ukraine and in Syria and in Mali are different things. In Syria and in Mali, it, there, 
they're, they're just uh, the, something to, that hides the special uh, services of the army. But we have to pr be able to prove it. But we will prove it. We will prove that this is not just a uh, some kind of independent structure. No, these structures are fully in controlled by the Russian government. And we are going to prove this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are many more questions, but we have one more very interesting panel coming up for this evening. And I think we have a hard stop at 9 o'clock. So I would just thank you again, uh, our panelists. And the audience, and I'm sure it's not the last time uh, we have the pleasure of hearing from them, and there'll be more opportunities for questions. Thank you. Uh, OK. Uh, merci beaucoup uh, pour votre patience. Uh, on a pris un peu de retard. Uh, for your patience, the interpreters were not aware that this was no longer the break. I thought we, have, we were going to have a break. So we are going to uh, start right away without uh, any uh, more interruption. We'll start the second round table. We'll go very quickly because we don't have much time left. And uh, we still have three uh, people to uh, listen to, which will be very interesting. Just two words. Why it seemed that following the discussion we just had, it's so important to have this second discussion now because as you uh, understood from what was said before, the human rights defenders in, in Russia uh, do their work in spite of everything that's happening to uh, document what Russia is doing outside of Russia in Syria where a group of human rights uh, defenders from Russia went to document crimes and our colleagues of Memorial but not only them in Ukraine on which uh, we were working as well of course and even in uh, several African countries where a number of uh, journalists were assassinated because they uh, <coughs> did these investigations. But in Russia as well, there is a fight for the defense of uh, human rights uh, violations. In, uh, Memorial, as you know, was liquidated and this liquidation was uh, confirmed by all the instances and the situation is very dangerous for them. Most uh, members uh, of uh, Memorial had to leave the country or remain in extremely difficult and dangerous conditions. And several of our colleagues in Memorial are now uh, under uh, accusation. All the members are collectively accused uh, of uh, uh, renewing Nazism, which is the most uh, Im uh, unbelievable accusation that Russian authorities have found for this organization fighting for uh, preservation of memories. But for reasons which are more than valid and important, the light usually is turned on what Russia is doing outside of Russia. And we don't speak that much about the situation which is getting more and more repressive and, and, and threatening in Russia for the people who are still uh, fighting in inside the country. That's why, without uh, waiting anymore, I will now give the floor to uh, Daniel, which comes from uh, the uh, organization OVD Info, which was created to uh, look at the repression against people who are uh, uh, demonstrating in the street, who show their opinion, and most of the time, they're a victim of severe repression. Thank you. Daniel. Talk uh, in English. I'm very sorry for that. Um, so uh, you might know that uh, at uh, the beginning of the um, Russian full-scale invasion, uh, almost uh, twenty thousands of people were uh, detained on on the streets. But then, uh, actually. This uh, um, uh, then it's uh, reduced significantly. Um, um, I don't know if we can use it. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, when it reduced significantly, and who were uh, those people who were detained? There were uh, almost. Uh, um, half of thousands of minors, uh, almost half of them were women, 
and uh, police uh, were was very violent. Uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, brutality. Uh, the government used a facial recognition system to track people, but still, I wanted more to discuss this uh, picture and why actually this uh, stopped. I think it's uh, very much related to uh, previous conversation. Uh, because uh, um, we can say that one of the root causes of this war is actually the situation with different civil freedoms uh, in Russia itself. And I just wanted to let you know what, uh, what it, it is actually to, to protest uh, um, in Russia and uh, what actually these uh, people are facing. Uh, who um, who were uh, on the streets, and uh, so they um, a lot of uh, them um, faces uh, quite uh, quite big um, penalties, and uh, I don't know whatever or not three and a half thousands is uh, of euros is big to you, but uh, to almost to to the majority of uh, Russians, it's a very very big uh, money. Uh, you can uh, also receive a jail term up to 30 uh, days, which could, uh, for um, uh, very interesting reasons, uh, repeat it multiply. And that's actually how government, uh, the strategy government used to, to prevent some people to go to the streets. But uh, another thing, very important, that you might easily have a criminal case and you might easily find yourself in prison for uh, many different reasons. Uh, the, the other thing I think could be uh, uh, interesting for lawyers that uh, the uh, recent years we observed the lawyers which are working with, uh, with us observed um, the situation when they are not even allowed to, to visit uh, the uh, detainees for um, very strange reasons. Uh, basically, whenever uh, the protest, the government is called so-called fortress plan and just shutting down every door of uh, all the police stations. Uh, but uh, I wanted also to 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 um, uh, go a little bit back. Uh, so ten years uh, uh, ago, the um, the fine for participation in, in, in the uh, rally uh, or broken related laws was 15 euros. Now it's three and thousands. Uh, there wasn't any jail terms. Now it's 30 days. And since uh, that time, uh, there was a, a dedicated uh, a criminal article introduced. Uh, to, uh, which allows uh, government to uh, put in prison people who broke this law a couple of times. And actually there was a cases of massive criminal cases uh, like uh, in 2021 when um, Navalny came back uh, in Russia. It was all, also, uh, many people actually are um, in prison as a result of that. So uh, my team, uh, my team registered almost 70,000 of uh, illegal detentions on, on the street during uh, this uh, this time. So um, you have to obtain the the um, legal permit in order to uh, to demonstrate, but you can't almost never you can't do that, and then you are broken the law, and then uh, police uh, brutally uh, brutally um, uh, det uh, detain you. And uh, as a result of interaction with police, you might easily have, uh, you might be easily uh, put in prison for, for a couple of years. And uh, nowadays, even uh, such things like single pickets for which you don't need to obtain uh, any kind of uh, permits according to the Russian law, it's uh, for numerous reasons also unfortunately uh, uh, restricted. So uh, all of this has a very, uh, very serious uh, chilling effect on the society, and that's why 
the uh, the protest, which first was on the street, transformed to uh, to um, the other forms. I also uh, wanted to tell you about a very uh, new practice of which became after the war um, of uh, um, actually uh, which is called. Uh, um, uh, discreditation of the Russian army, and this is a very smart tool. Uh, there is no uh, definition in, in the law what is discreditation. In, in the reality, it is uh, everything. When you are going uh, into the street without even placard or with, you know, I don't know, shoes of colors of uh, Ukrainian uh, flag, or you left some comment in social media, uh, you receive this administrative punishment, and then if you receive the second one during six months, you can be criminally criminally persecuted. So uh, this way, government and there are a lot of cases across uh, uh, Russia related to that, and this is uh, a, a way how the government actually uh, manipulating uh, uh, people. So. Um, I also wanted to just briefly uh, put some numbers regarding what was happening with the freedom of expression in Russia last year, uh, last decade. There was a lot of uh, hundreds of attacks, hundreds of criminal persecutions, uh, hundreds of cases of closure of media and of course uh, uh, killings. Uh, nowadays, we have uh, we have uh, more or less de facto military censorship, as you know. A lot of uh, resources were uh, blocked, uh, and a lot of journalists, uh, hundreds of journalists, were forced to leave um, country. And the situation in the freedom of assembly also, uh, from back where from ten years ago, uh, is uh, very uh, difficult. Uh, you might heard about foreign agents. There are a lot of foreign agents in this room today, as I observed. And actually, quite a lot of NGOs were forced to liquidate um, as a result of that. There is also misusage of uh, anti extremist uh, uh, law and uh, um, the other tool, which is called undesirable, undesirable organization, which is uh, also more or less uh, like. Uh, calling uh, organization terrorists, so it's complete uh, block of any any kind of interaction with the uh, organizations. And uh, of course, uh, uh, and of course, uh, last uh, years we, we uh, a lot of um, human rights uh, organizations were forced to stop uh, their work. Uh, uh, I just wanted, um, as a last word, to show you this uh, interesting picture, uh, which is show, which is shown in the rating of uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, the wars, and different uh, protests. And uh, yes, we are now. Uh, uh, we are now. Um, the, his rating is rather high. But uh, uh, I hope that this picture gives you a clue that it, it wouldn't be forever. Quite soon uh, it, will, uh, it will change. Um, every time we are thinking that it is the last, you know, last massive protest, but, but then for some uh, very strange reasons like local ecological protests or something else, there is a huge spike of protests and I'm sure it will uh, soon happen again in Russia. But, uh, uh, we all we all should uh, uh, should be uh, should be uh, ready for that. I, I also wanted to uh, talk more about current criminal cases, but unfortunately, I think we are short of time. Merci, merci beaucoup, Daniel. Thank you very much, Daniel for these very sad statistics. I will now give the floor to Natalia Morozova, who will talk, who will tell us about a new study made by FIDH on the repressive law in uh, Russia. Good evening. Thank you for having stayed up until now. I know uh, you must be all tired. My statement will be quite 
a brief before joining the FIDH. I worked as a legal practitioner at Memorial, and I also worked with OVD Info in Russia. And before the courts, I defended people who had been detained during demonstrations. Today, this evening, I would like to present a report that we have uh, uh, drafted. This gives you a picture of uh, the legislative situation in Russia and what has happened in recent years. This is something following a report that was published in 2018, published by Sasha, indeed. And you can see, see a copy of it at on a table at the entrance. It's in Russian and in English. This document has three objectives. It gives you an overall picture of repressive laws in Russia. So there are three main objectives. One is that it should be a working tool for researchers and legal practitioners working on Russia modern-day Russia. Second objective is to show how, step-by-step, step, Russia is tightening the screws and is reducing rights and freedoms of civil society. The third objective is that this should be a memo for Russian lawmakers of the future so that they will know which laws should be repealed first and foremost. And that in order, in order to uh, reestablish rule of law. So, as Danielle had said earlier, since 2012, the State Duma has been enacting a greater number of uh, repressive laws and Therefore, it has been nicknamed the crazy printer. This printer is far from being out of ink. Why? Because since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022, the state Duma has beaten all records in terms of passing new laws. And when I was working in Russia, I worked with all these laws, but it was only when I began to work on coming up with this overall picture that I realized to what extent it was an absurd situation. Because all these laws, the quantity of laws, linked not just to the repressive state, but also linked to the fact that Russian lawmakers themselves are not very capable when it comes to drafting laws, because every law enacted almost immediately requires amendments. For example, the uh, noto notorious law on the discreditation of the Russian army that was passed on 4 March 2022 required amendments on the 25th of March. That is three weeks later. Three weeks later, this law required amendments. This means that the caliber of these laws is even worse than their quantity. Now, I will give you three examples to show you how these laws are being drafted in the Russian Federation. The first example. Slander in Russia has been a criminal offense since 2012, and you can get a sentence of up to five years, and this has been the case since 2020. The uh, politician Alexei Navalny, when he went back to uh, Russia in January 2021, he was accused of slandering a World War II 
veteran. In Russia, we call it the Great Patriotic War. Of course, Navalny was found guilty of this offense. But this 95-year-old veteran could not attend the trial. He was only present through WhatsApp. And he did not even participate in the appeal because of his physical state. He was sick. He's 95 years old. So the Russian state, the problem of the crime of uh, slander is that it is a prosecution which is called a private prosecution. So that means that a person can only be prosecuted if there is a statement from a victim. However, as you can imagine, there are very few World War II veterans who are still alive in Russia. Therefore, during this trial, the Russian authorities understood this problem. Therefore, only three days after the verdict against Navalny, lawmakers passed a new law criminalizing the public spread of false information on veterans of the Second World War, as well as the uh, circulation of information that insults the memory of the defenders of the motherland or attacks the honor and dignity of a veteran of the Great Patriotic War. So now the state allowed itself to prosecute people for an insult to the memory, even without a living victim. A second example, as Daniel had said, street demonstrations in Russia are almost impossible. It's very hard for people who live in France and in Paris to imagine this, but in Russia you cannot just simply take to the streets and demonstrate. Because every Demonstration must be authorized by the authorities of the uh, city. And of course, the authorities do not provide this authorization. They do not grant it. So it is an offense if you do conduct in, can, if you do uh, participate in demonstrations. The only way to demonstrate is to demonstrate uh, alone. That's the only way people can demonstrate, like a one-man demonstration. In June 2019, a journalist of the opposition, Ivan Galunov, was arrested based on false accusations. And his colleagues came up with the idea of a carousel of one-man demonstrations. That is, somebody shows up with a sign, stands there for a minute or two, then puts the sign away, and a second person comes and demonstrates, and so on and so forth. So the police could not do anything because this was a one-man demonstration that was allowed by law. But as you might guess, a few months later, lawmakers passed a law stipulating that this type of demonstration was, in fact, a mass demonstration and required authorization. And so participation in this type of demonstration would then become illegal. The third example is about the uh, sadly notorious legislation called the Foreign Agent Act. This law was introduced in 2012 to strangle Russian civil society. Since then, this law has uh, traveled across the planet. It has been adopted in countries of the former Soviet Union, such as Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan, as well as four countries of Latin America, like Nicaragua, El Salvador, Venezuela, and Guatemala. So for 10 years, Russia has continued to change this law 
increasingly reducing the possibility of uh, NGOs and independent journalists to do their work. It's as if it has been cutting the tail of a cat one centimeter at a time. So we have had to follow very closely all the amendments made to this law. Because, well, at Memorial, this of course affected us directly. So in 2019 and 2020, we had many, many fines because we had to label all our information on on page on all pages that were uh, posted online. We had to have a, like a, a label as foreign agent, and so we had massive fines for not having had these magic words figuring. But once we uh, got a uh, dismissal of a, a case because it turned out that it was not on our site, but it was on the site of a media that had cited Memorial. So the judge said that our case would be dismissed. And as you may guess, a few months later, another law was enacted saying that all media had to mention foreign agent if they were mentioning organizations such as ours. So, all of this is just to tell you how Russian lawmakers work today. The legislative process in Russia is like a game of cat and mouse. Civil society is seeking a way out of the law, and then the lawmakers pass more laws trying to ban everything. For example, the day before yesterday, lawmakers proposed that feminism be declared an extremist ideology. With regard to what Natalia was saying, the very first um, report, that, let's say the, in 2018, the first 50 uh, laws were inspired by a, a monument the mon they're in this museum for uh, apartheid, and there is a list of all the laws that the state had to introduce to try to uh, prevent this resistance to apartheid. The creators of this monument thought that the more laws that we will have, the more we have success indicators, because perhaps these uh, amendments, because the laws m had no made no sense. There, it's not just the folly of the lawmakers, but it was that it's always trying to, there was always civil society looking for a way out to continue its work despite all restrictions in their work. And then lawmakers would try to close all the windows with new laws. This monument in South Africa to apartheid well, it marked me because I thought all the legislation, this is going to create a monument to civil society that has put up this resistance for so many years. On that note, just a little note of hope while everyone gets their headset, headsets. Now I'm going to give the floor to our last speaker and then we will have to stop. Just a few questions because we don't have much time. Jana Gelmel is from Yekaterinburg and she is a human rights defender and she works on the situation in prisons. We wanted to um, start, end with that because there are exiled Russians. There are um, more people who have left Russia than after the revolution in 1917 to give you an idea of the magnitude and are also there are people in prisons in Russia, and that's the second Russia, and then there's the third Russia, people who live in detention centers and in penitentiaries in Russia and who are participating actively in crimes committed 
outside of Russia, because as you know, the Wagner groups are recruiting people to send them to uh, Ukraine. So it's thinking about this uh, third part of Russia, those who are most deprived of rights. That's how we wanted to conclude this evening. With that, I will give the floor to Yana, who will be speaking in Russian. Good evening. So the Russian uh, criminal or Russian human rights defenders are very concerned about this situation and what's happening now is just a massive problem given the many um, sources we have including information from the inmates, their relatives, human rights de defenders, the Wagner groups have gone to visit 97 correctional col penal colonies in 45 regions of Russia, trying to recruit 10,360 inmates. And we see that these figures match what the independent media have been saying. And we see that 5,786 inmates of which 236 were sent to Ukraine. This is in September 22. According to Aftazak Live, the number of recruited inmates might be more than twice, that is about 15,000 in mid-October 2022. Now, you can see this uh, on a site that in November and October of 2022, the number of uh, inmates dropped by 23,000. And this had not even been seen during the last amnesty in 2015. These data, well, we think we can confirm them. And we are confirming information, the number of of people who've been recruited are about uh, former inmates uh, amount to 50,000. Of them, 10,000 who are still living. Some of them are uh, either injured. And there are different stages in this recruitment. The first is in the central part of Russia, there was a campaign for recruitment from uh, June to September. And the second stage was uh, the Far East, U or Urals and Siberia. And in early January 2023, there was information. We heard that in the Chechen Republic, there also were there was there was rather a wave of recruitment now for these um, inmates there were two uh, penal colonies in the rostov oblast where you've got um, inmates and according to inf official information these two penal con colonies are now being uh, overhauled that is they're closed how does this recruitment take place? The Wagner Group goes to the penal colonies, gathers all the inmates, and begins to tell them about freedom, that they can make money, and tells them that they can make between 100 and 200 thousand rubles. That's between 1,600 and uh, 3,200 euros a month. And also they talk about 5 million if the inmates die and 300,000 rubles if they're, they are injured. Prigozhin also always says that you have a choice now. That is, you can go to fight or not, but when the defense ministry comes, they will not be asking a question. That is, they'll be telling you, in other words. Ah, so they're given five minutes to think about it. And then there is a selection. They go through two offices. The um, Wagner employees have already prepared for themselves a list of the inmates that they want. 
they have the cards with their uh, their cases and they select the ones that they want so as soon as the inmate walks in the door they sign a contract on non-disclosure they ask who will receive money they have a uh, power of attorney drawn up and then they are off immediately sent off to war to fight without any type of training now if we're if we're to look at uh, the ones they prefer who i have a list of the inmates who are now fighting and you can see that the articles on which they've been convicted that it's very scary and as far as i remember one of these people well he was always convicted for rape and there were some episodes of uh, of um people under the age of 14 so that is that rape for rape of people under uh, 14 years of age and these were repeated offenders very serious crimes these were not articles like for example a drunken fight and someone without any premeditation uh, killed somebody this is always with premeditation I also want to talk about why the inmates uh, go to fight nobody can understand that I have discussed this with inmates a long time because I've been working for a long time with the penitentiary system in the Russian Federation and they all think that if they go to Ukraine they will be able to flee but the, there are only rare cases when people are able to flee to run away they are more often than not killed by people in their own detachment so I have talked uh, with instructors from the Wagner private military company and we discussed this situation that these are inmates going to fight and there are many among the prisoners of war they say that if they're prisoners of war that means the uh, commanders have allowed a lot of violations then a group of uh, Wagner members meet they talk about 70% uh, of, of them are inmates and 30% those who have not uh, been in prison so though those 70% if there's a situation has has to uh, execute the 70 percent though if there are violations we can't say exactly what the statistics are but I have talked to the relatives of these uh, inmates who have died and most of them come back with uh, their heads destroyed you've probably all seen the videos where they're basically their skulls are smashed and most of the inmates have these uh, smashed skulls because these inmates are quite uh, particular peculiar and they are not, not, not the type of people to bow before anyone they have their own world vision they have their own way of thinking and if Prigozhin thinks that he can deal with them well he can't that's not the way it is so at this point in time they are starting to come back from war and what's happening in Russia is just horrific let's just take some uh, let's say most uh, vivid examples for example it, it was uh, I think uh, Kurga there was a Racha of Machev, somebody who had been in jail for 14 years was at war for six months came back and he kept an entire village in fear and horror walked around with axes and and with a hammer and he's again uh, he killed uh, a retired woman and this old Zhenya says, well, I don't, Jadja Zhenya, this is Prigozhin. He says, well, okay, he's again in jail. He says, it's okay, I'll find something for him to do. And we don't know what is going to happen to him. So this is not the only case. This is just a very vivid example. 
in some villages, people are just afraid to go to the store. People who have gone to serve, uh, they're even uh, wounded, they go back home, they go to the store, they don't have enough money to drink, so they begin to terrorize the salespeople, saying, we were protecting the motherland, we are heroes, so you owe us. Of course, such beasts, wild beasts, well, I'm not saying this negatively, but they are wild beasts. As in inmates, they're being bred by the government, by the state. Human rights defenders in Russia since the end of the 90s have been screaming that torture is happening everywhere in prisons. The torture. For example, you know that people uh, stay in solitary confinement for years. They have no social contacts. Because if you are not, you know, in, in cahoots with the, uh, the penitentiary system, you cannot receive letters, you cannot have any meetings, you're always in solitary confinement. You don't even have the right to call relatives, not to speak of, let's say, if you violate any rules, you can't even call a lawyer. You cannot do anything, in fact. You are constantly being monitored by the um, SDP, the disciplinary section. They were very active in the past. They have been abolished, but they still exist. And the inmates are raped. Not, not just with sexual, sexual organs, but with, let's say, uh, a kettle, with any instruments. So these people, how can I put this? These people are phys psychologically broken. They're broken in jail. They've gone to war. They've seen even more death. They themselves began to kill. And they will come back home. And it will be very, very horrifying. What kind of future will there be in Russia with such people? This is really very quite terrifying, in fact. Thank you. It's very difficult to end after this. Uh, we reached the end of the time we had. I think we come back to the start of our uh, conversation, like Alexander Cherkasov and the other human rights defenders have said, from the beginning of the war in Chechnya. They say that the, the people who returned from Chechnya, who are going to be <coughs> working in the police, in the penitentiary center, uh, they're going to be awful because the impunity that you heard about at the beginning of the evening is going to be reintroduced in civilian life by uh, when leaving the uh, army, they will act in civil life as they acted in the army in Chechnya. And this is exactly what happened. For the 20 years of the war in Chechnya, this impunity and the tortures uh, overflown. Even the terms used in the prison uh, uh, are terms which uh, originated in Chechnya. We can clearly see where it comes from. So we went one step further now, and the detainees are sent to Ukraine where they become uh, criminals but armed uh, by, by war means and the impunity that they bring with their experience. That's why it seemed to be very important in spite of the time that was long, and I think you're all quite tight now, to uh, uh, expose all this logic of impunity which comes back, it returns to its starting point, and which touches those who uh, created it to start with. We really have time for one question, if there is an extremely urgent question, and then we'll have to finish, unfortunately, because we have to leave the room at 9 o'clock. Can you hear me? I have a question which might be a little difficult, as a young person, a young woman, what can we do at our level to fight, if we're too small to fight ourselves against such atrocities, but when 
how can we have an action that can have an impact, even limited, on what is happening? How can you bring our stone to the building? Thank you very much for this question. I think it's, it brings a perfect conclusion to our uh, evening to bring some more hope after these two and a half hours rather uh, difficult. I've, I suggest that we give the floor to uh, the speakers one after the other. What can we do here? I did not understand this question because I don't understand French. Okay, good, good question. Okay, uh, if you like. Yes, I, yes, yes, yes. I, I, oh, it's okay. I had the idea that you have exactly this question. Okay. So I think uh, why uh, uh, I was personally speaking about the past because I have a feeling that uh, uh, the whole uh, international framework of human rights is uh, a bit uh, not in shape because, uh, you know, if we look at the um, cases of the European Court of Human Rights related to Russia, 90% uh, of leading cases since uh, uh, 23 years are not implemented. And uh, there are many, many, many things which I, I think were uh, absolutely clear and uh, known to um, to um, everyone, including uh, how the Russian army is uh, um, what, what it is doing in, in in different places across the world. So I think uh, we have to reflect how to change this system in order to. Uh, to prevent these things in the future in order to learn from uh, all of our mistakes. And I personally convinced that it is an international problem and I think it is a young people who could actually solve this problem uh, and not the people who are currently uh, in charge of that. I hope that... Okay, I agree with Danielle, but I, I don't have any answer. I don't think that anybody has an answer. For me, I decided that, I mean, an answer good for all. I think we have to, we never have to lose our focus on what is happening and understand that civil society, well, we talk a lot about the war itself. It's, it's very nice, very good. We have to keep this on, in focus, but we also have to uh, remember that the Russian society exists and one day all this, when this will be over, we should not turn our back to Russia. I think that um, we should just, I think the only thing you can do is attract attention to this problem. I don't think there's anything else you can do to help. I think that for all those who, you know, are working in civil society, you have to continue to support them, like Memorial, the associations that help prisoners, or trying to uh, defend their rights, you know, so that they don't have to go to uh, Ukraine and kill people. There are civil society organizations still continuing to work despite the obstacles. They face a lot of uh, internal and external problems because as representatives of uh, the uh, country that's the aggressor, they they are meeting up, meeting with a lot of resistance. So I think you need to support them in all circumstances. You have the coordinates of Memorial France to support Memorial, which has been disbanded in Russia officially, so that it can continue its action through sophisticated support to help those who remain in the country. Th you can support them through the action that is up on the screen, but there are many other associations that are working and need help. And I think that the more you talk about them, talk about these executions, and talk to your governments, talk to international institutions to ensure that they they not just look at what Russia is doing outside of Russia, but also what it's doing inside, because 
what happens inside is going to determine the future of Russia, but also is going to determine what happens in countries that are being attacked by Russia now. So thank you for your patience, and I would like to thank the speakers and wish you all a very pleasant evening.